Hey guys, good morning everyone. So I'm Gary Thorpe with McCain Foods. So I just want to thank uh, Martin Moroni and Bioenergy Australia uh, for the opportunity to, to speak this morning. Um, so I'm just going to give you a basic overview of our processing plant, um, our wood fired boilers, and what I see as opportunities for improvement in the area of biomass for energy. Uh, just a little bit on me. So I've got an engineering background. Um, of 20 years looking after our wood fired boilers and steam systems. Um, we're mostly doing the maintenance, um, you know, tuning the boilers, boiler performance, that sort of thing. 10 years in risk management, uh, quality, safety, environment, and risk. So, just on our Smithton plant, so we're located on the far northwest coast of beautiful Tasmania. Um, and we're only approximately 20 minute drive to Cape Grim, where the cleanest air in the world is recorded. Uh, so it's really important for us, you know, that we, we stay on top of our game. As far as our environmental goes, uh, we employ 120 full-time workers. Um, there's approximately 375 million individual potatoes we process every year. Um, that's done for retail, food service and QSR customers. A majority of our potatoes are sourced from soil in the northwest and also down the midlands of Tasmania. We have 80 plus growers who follow stringent McCain food safety protocols. And we are just in the final stages of commissioning a $37, $37 million plant upgrade uh, to safeguard the plant's future in Tasmania. So McCain have been producing um, delicious high quality food, you know, that families can trust for over 60 years now globally. Um, in doing this, we have strived to make efficient use of the natural resources we use. So globally, um, we have now committed to halving our plant CO2 emissions, moving towards zero waste to landfill, using 100% renewable electricity and using packaging and water sustainability. Um, so we're committed to doing this while continuing to grow our business. So globally over the last four years, we've reduced our CO2 emissions by 4% per tonne of finished product. Um, we aim to have a, we aim to have achieved a 50% reduction in emissions by 2030, um, which includes ceasing the use of coal and moving to 60% renewable energy. So just a bit now on our, our wood-fired boiler. So we have two six megawatt steam line boilers that were installed you know, around 1988. Uh, they're capable of producing 10 tonne of steam each and, and that's highly dependent on the fuel moisture. We burn approximately 100 tonne of wood waste per day. The majority of that is, is now wood chips. And we top up with a small amount of coal sawdust briquette. So it's basically a compressed briquette. Um, as required, and we only use that to make up for the, the moisture in the fuel. Um, so we're working hard to remove that coal component of our fuel mix, so we want to get rid of that altogether, so we can be 100% renewable energy. Uh, the challenge for us is the inefficiencies created by the high moisture in our fuel. So um, we get fuel that varies between 45% to 60% moisture, which is very high. You know, you put that in perspective, so every Every hundred ton of you know that comes through our door, you know, it could be you know 59, 60 ton of water in it. Um, it causes reduced steam output and pollution. So the, the higher the moisture in the fuel, the the, the higher the pollution, uh, particularly during the start up and light loads. So you know, when your boilers are, are running fine, everything's up to temp, you know, it's good. But as soon as you start ramping off, um, that's when the the wet fuel creates issues. Um, probably an important challenge to, for us, like moving 100 tonne of fuel a day is the fuel system use. Um, and that's you know, to transport the, the fuel from storage to the boiler. We've learned a lot over the years. Um, and look, it's an area that anyone considering installing a biomass boiler, they should look at it uh, very closely. You know, just for example, 
one example for us, we used to have mild steel augers to transport the fuel. Um, I changed the flights on those augers probably every six months. Um, we changed the stainless steel and now we don't touch them, you know, get three or four years out of them. Um, so the fuel system is a very, very important component of it. Um, just improvements. So look, obviously having our processing plant in the middle of the town, you know, presents many environmental challenges. You look, and, and as I said earlier, we have to stay at the top of our game. Um, we recently installed a boiler bag house to reduce the particular emissions. That costs us about 1.3 million to do that. Um, we've just signed a contract with local fuel suppliers, Britain Brothers, and um, yeah, we're very excited about that. Uh, we want to work closely with them guys to investigate opportunities for supplying us with, with drier fuel. Um, that contract started uh, last week, actually 1st of November, so which is great for us. Um, we're currently investigating the possibility of installing a, a new biomass boiler um, with the capability of using excess steam to put electricity back into the grid via a steam generator. Um, the numbers will be tight on that, whether stacks up or not, I don't know, but um, you would need a we would need a guarantee of a dry fuel supply um, yeah, before, you, before you could even look at that. So opportunities um, in Tasmania, I think there's further opportunities for renew renewable energy uh, to, be, to be obtained from our, our renewable pine plantations, our eucalyptus plantations, and most importantly, I think the residue that's left on the forest floor from harvesting, I think there's not a huge opportunity there um, if that can be gathered um, and given to a processor to, to chip it small enough so it can be burned and dried out. I think that that's a huge opportunity there for us. Um, currently that residue from pine and eucalyptus, it's difficult to burn. The industrial boilers, just to, due to the high moisture controls, uh, high moisture content, sorry. Well, I know the more modern boilers are, are, are better at it, uh, but at the end of the day, you know, it's high moisture is still, still difficult to burn. You can't burn water. Um, if the capability was there to dry it, then it would be an excellent fuel. I think that, that sawmillers, forestry industries require support and outlets to turn what is traditionally a waste into a high quality renewable energy source. Um, just in our little, little area of Circle Head, um, we've got a, obviously McCain, um, we have a sawmill, we have an abattoirs, and we've also got the local government, you know, that you need the swimming pool, um, all by using uh, wood waste. So, you know, the, the dry fuel here would be great for us. And uh, there's also a milk processing facility. I know they've considered it in recent times. Um, for McCain, look, it, it's, it's just a good business decision. Um, growing potatoes in Tasmania is, is expensive compared to anywhere else in the McCain world. You know, that, that's no fault of the farmer or McCain, but the reality is like transport, diesel um, and fertiliser, you know, the, the most expensive in the world. So we, we've got to um, look at opportunities, you know, to be efficient in our plants. Um, so we're committed to continuing to support our growers, uh, which means investing in a plant that is sustainable in both the business and environmental sense. Um, so industries such as McCain um, require incentives to expand on opportunities provided by using renewable energy in the form of access to dry wood waste. So basically that's it for me and um, yep, I'll hand over to Trevor. Thank you very much. All right, thanks Gary. Let's see if I can get my screen to work here. Yeah. Is uh, PowerPoint come up there? Uh, it's in small. It's there, but it's, uh, it's small at the moment. There we go. All set? Yep. Thanks, Trevor. All right. Thanks, Gav. Um, 
Yeah, I'm Trevor Innes. I look after technical and sustainability for Timberlink. Um, so I'll just say a few words about Timberlink and a bit of background and then talk about our biomass boiler at our Bell Bay sawmill. Um, so we're a major softwood timber manufacturer nationally. Um, we process about a million tonne of log um, each year through our two mills. Uh, so we've got one at uh, Bell Bay in Tassie, so that's cutting about 400,000, 400 to 450,000 tonne of log. And then one at Tarpena in South Australia cutting about 650 at the moment. Um, we've invested heavily in the mills. Um, basically, we're trying to bring them up to world standard. We can't get Bell Bay to a world class kind of volume throughput because there aren't enough trees here. But uh, Tarpena, we're well on the way. Uh, we're most of the way through a $100 million investment program. Uh, that should be completed about March. Uh, that's centered on Tarpena. We spent about $10 million in, uh, in Bell Bay and 90 at Tarpena building a, an entire new saw line up there. The other exciting project we've got underway at the moment, we're building a combined cross laminated timber and glue laminated timber plant for startup in 2023. Um, so CLT is basically making great big panels of timber for predominantly multi-storey construction. Uh, it's a technology that's <clears throat> been around in uh, Europe for a while now. Uh, it's caught on in North America as well and slowly getting a foothold in Australia. Um, so that's about 60 million and we're <clears throat> I know it's a startup in 2023, but uh, we're already well underway. We've contracted the major equipment supply. Just a bit on sustainability. So we've run a strong sustainability program for about the last five years. Um, essentially, this is kind of very strongly supported by our own new forests. They're a, a global forest management investment company. Um, they wanted to get a handle on how our sustainability performance track over time. So I've come up with a, basically a set of indicators which we track each month and produce a, a composite score. Uh, you can see that at the graph at the bottom there, how we're progressing, fairly flat for a few years. And then last financial year, we had a step up with some major projects completed. Uh, each year we produce a public sustainability report. The, <clears throat> the F20 report should be out in the next couple of weeks. Um, similar to McCain, we've, we've set carbon reduction targets. We recently had those approved by the Science-Based Targets Initiative. That's the global body that verifies um, and approves these, these things. Um, so <clears throat> we're targeting a 53% decrease in scope one and scope two um, emissions per cubic metre by 2030. Um, we're already well underway. You can see the graph up above, the little gold line there is an actual, so we're done a bit over sort of 25% already. Um, so we're only the ninth Australian company all up. So we have our targets approved and uh, globally, I think we're only the third forestry and forest products to get targets approved at that, um, at that more ambitious one and a half degree of warming level. Uh, the biomass boiler. So at uh, Bell Bay, we've got, a, uh, we've got a 20 megawatt boiler. It's a moving great type boiler. Um, it was originally constructed to burn waste on, uh, on the site. It was originally constructed as an MDF plant. Uh, it's the old Starwood plant at Bell Bay. So when the sawmill was uh, built on the site in 2008, the boiler was adapted to burn the, the different feedstock. Um, in addition, we fitted a fabric filter bag house to minimise the particulate emissions um, for EPA compliance. So uh, to give you an idea, I think our, um, our emissions limit is 100 milligrams per cube. Um, of air out um, and when we're running the bag house uh, it's about five less than five so they're highly efficient at, at removing particulates from the airflow um, so the feedstock the feedstock all arises from logs that are um, Chanakustu certified to both FSC and responsible wood um, currently all of the log we take in is from one supplier, which is um, Timberlands, they manage the forests on behalf of our owner, New Forest, so we're essentially vertically integrated. Feedstock's a mixture of grain sawdust, dry shavings and hog mill waste. Uh, we have the same problem as Carrie, trying to tune the, the moisture content to something that the boiler's happy running is an ongoing challenge. Um, we've got a relatively unsophisticated uh, feedstock system at the moment. Um, at Tarpena, we've got a uh, a more sophisticated system where green sawdust and dry shavings are held separate on uh, walking floors. 
they feed into screws and then they're combined with uh, moisture content uh, feedback control. So that's something we'll look at for Bell Bay in the future. Uh, the byproducts are all of comparatively low value currently. Um, I mean, it is possible over time we'll find higher value uses for the clean fibre. That's kind of what's happened around the rest of the world. If you go and have a look at these sorts of things in Europe, none of them would burn clean sawdust or clean, um, clean dry shavings. They'd um, normally burn bark. Um, sort of the opposite here at the moment. We've got a reasonable market for bark into um, you know landscaping kind of uses, whereas the sawdust. We, we uh, sell for not very much money. Um, I mean, the benefits of having a biomass boiler I mean, causes minimal pollution. I've already talked about the particulate emissions. They're very low um, because of the bag house we're operating. The greenhouse gas impact of the boiler is really low. Um, I mean, because the feedstock's all 100% renewable, um, the actual net emission in terms of carbon equivalent, CO2 so equivalent is really just deriving from methane and, and NOx emissions. Um, that's, you know, that's how the anger calculations work. Um, so just as a back of an envelope for a gigajoule of heat energy, the greenhouse gas emissions are about 1.3 1, 1 kilos. Um, for comparison, for the F19U using the anger uh, multiplies the equivalent electricity impact would have been 52.8 kilograms. Um, CO2, so it's, you know, it's an order of magnitude different just about. Um, so, you know, to put that in context, if we switch to electric heating, not that we ever would, the additional emissions would be about 10,000 extra cars on the road. Um, and of course, it's a lot cheaper, you know, $400,000 very roughly is kind of the value of the residue we'd burn each year in the current markets. If we wanted to buy electricity to create that amount of heat, it'd be about $16 million a year. Um, of course, there's no such thing as a free lunch. Um, I was about to discover that fabric filter bag houses are by their nature quite difficult things to operate on wood waste fired boilers. They're high maintenance, they're prone to failure. Um, if everything's you know, not set up perfectly right, it's very easy to burn out bags or have friction holes in bags, um, which then requires obviously you've got to shut down, cool down to go in there and fix it. Um, they do require specialist skills to operate and maintain. I mean, at the least, you'd need to have a boiler ticket. Um, they do operate much better with a stable load. Um, traditionally, timber kilns operate kind of like an oven. You know, you roll the timber in and shut the doors and switch it on and it goes through a heat-up cycle and drying and then uh, steaming. But that's really bad for a wood waste-fired boiler. Um, so we've converted uh, two of our batch kilns into uh, large one large continuous kiln. So they're about 30% more thermally efficient. So we can get a lot more volume through for the same amount of heat. And in terms of the boiler operation, the heat load is far more stable. Um, it's a continuous process. It doesn't have individual, you know, heat up or steaming cycles. Um, so that's made a big difference to the efficiency of the boiler. Um, but because of the wide product mix we produce, we still have to operate two conventional kilns. Um, the other obvious disadvantage is that boilers are very expensive. Um, on most all milling sites, the throughput's governed by the by the boiler. Um, it's, you know, you can think in rough terms to buy a boiler costs about a million dollars per megawatt. So to replace our boiler with a new equivalent would be about twenty million dollars. Um, and once you've got a twenty megawatt boiler, it's very difficult to turn it into a twenty-five megawatt boiler. So, in conclusion. Um, it is the most practicable option for process heat for sawmills. Uh, sawmills that are kiln drying their product require a hell of a lot of process heat. Um, the fuel is readily available and currently anyway, it's low cost. Um, I support Gary's comments that if we can get into a world where we can use residue out of the forest, that will make a big difference to the, you know, the, the cost equation of generating electricity out of a much bigger boiler. It's got the lowest environmental impact, certainly in terms of carbon emissions. Um, and yeah, as I just mentioned, cogen may be viable in some instances. It's not currently for us at the moment. We've had a good look at it, but hopefully in the future it will be. Yeah, thanks. And with that, I'll hand over to Elena. Thank you, Trevor. Just got to figure out here. 
Thanks, Tre- Trevor and your Lena. It's it's Gavin here. Just uh, we're running a little bit behind time. Really loving the uh, presentations. Just uh, if we can just keep them uh, keep them short, I suppose, uh, so everyone can fit theirs in. Sure, I'll speed my own. Thanks. Um, Trevor, if you could just stop sharing your screen, please. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to. I can't seem to get to my screen controls. Here we go. Hey, good morning, everyone. I'm, I'm Yelena. I'm the Group Marketing and Communications Manager at Greenham. Um, we're Tasmania's uh, largest beef processor. Um, just a bit of background on Greenham. We're 100% Australian owned and we've been in the beef industry. Um, we've been supplying Aussie beef for 120 years. So we have processing facilities in um, Tongala, Victoria, um, Smithton, Tasmania and um, in Gippsland, Victoria. Today I'll just be talking about our Tasmanian operations and how we utilise bioenergy there. Um, you might be familiar with some of our beef brands as well, um, specific to Tasmania would be our Cape Grim and our Robins Island Wagyu. So we utilise biofuel to power our boiler, um, which produces steam for the Smithson facility. So we use the steam for sterilisation of equipment and cleaning um, and, you know, the powering, the rendering cookers on a daily basis. Um, so a bit about our journey with uh, bioenergy. We, um, we're we using coal, um, uh, but we, oh, sorry, I'll just go back. <laughs> um, we were using coal, but we would like to move away from fossil fuels um, at Greenham as we're actively seeking to use rene renewable fuel sources. Um, so we moved on to use uh, pyrethrum briquettes um, in 2016 renewable and local energy source, um, carbon neutral. Um, and this was all sourced from BRA, Botanical Resources Australia. Um, but the boiler did require significant upgrades um, to handle the ash residue from the pyrethrum. Um, so most recently, just in April uh, this year, we commissioned a new boiler um, because our previous boiler um, came to the end of its useful life. Um, and with that, we moved on to uh, wood chips as a fuel source. Um, so it is uh, the wood chips retrieved as a byproduct from the logging and milling of timber for softwood plantations, um, and you know lower emissions uh, we're getting with this carbon neutral and cost effective as well. Um, however, uh, we do need to use more compared to the pyrethrum that we were using previously. So moving to the wood chip boiler, we needed to invest in a new, new boiler. Um, we worked with Justin Pacific to install the new, um, the new boiler. Um, you'll be hearing from them later in this session as well. Um, and we did select wood chips based on availability and proximity of ongoing supply. Um, we also needed to consider housing the, the new boiler um, in a, in a, and fitted with an economizer and particulate matter to um, to manage that. Uh, the construction was about three months and four weeks installation. Um, that was a sort of estimated um, time, but we did sort of have some COVID delays. So some considerations um, before we commissioned, um, we had to do a environmental um, effects report, which identified two potential um, environmental effects. So we needed to consider the um, air emissions and also the, um, the noise emissions. So we engaged um, some specialists, um, which I've noted here, um, and the investigations after completing the report, we determined that um, the air and noise emissions were from the proposed activities met the standards um, required under the environmental protection policies. So some of the uh, benefits from moving to the boiler with the wood chip, um, we have improved plant efficiency and capacity, reduced maintenance, 
a net decrease in greenhouse um, gas emissions. And it also reduced um, the transport distance from about 240 kilometre uh, round trip to four kilometres. So this further reduced um, emissions from transport as well. Um, thank you very much, guys. And I've just popped my details up there if anybody would like to connect or um, ask any questions later. Thank you very much. Thanks, Elena. It's uh, you, next one is uh, Christian. Are you online? Yeah, I am. All right, I'll hand across to you, Christian. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Yelena. Uh, good morning uh, from New Zealand. Um, today, I would like to take the opportunity uh, to present a few biomass boiler plants, uh, which have been utilizing biomass residues. Uh, before I go to those showcases, I thought it might be beneficial to show you images of the most common uh, residues uh, which get utilized in our boilers in Australasia. Uh, not included are energy intensified fuels like wood pellets, briquettes, or torrified wood pellets, and I've also excluded herbaceous uh, residues. The most consistent and highest quality biomass residues are wood chips. Uh, although they are similar in shape, they will be quite different in source, uh, size, and uh, water content, as you can see here in those images. Another very co commonly used residue is hog fuel. Although similar to wood chips, hog fuel is less consistent when it comes uh, to the shape and size, uh, which you can see here in those uh, eight images. One of the cheaper residues are wood peelings. The utilization uh, requires uh, tailored handling systems uh, to avoid issues when feeding a boiler plant. Uh, they are more stringy and hence they, they, they tend to bridge. Large amounts of sawdust are available wherever timber is cut or sized down. Sawdust directly from a mill can be uh, uh, very wet though and uh, requires a tailored boiler plant to ensure performance guaranteed output and low emissions. Shredded material is basically hog fuel and uh, the image demonstrate how inconsistent this uh, 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 residue can be size-wise. Shavings and sticks are just more waste streams which can be utilized in boiler plants. One of the more uh, challenging uh, residues, as we heard uh, probably before, is bark due to its size, size and contamination. However, some of our customers operate their plants with 100% bark since many years. So you would find, especially in the Northern Hemisphere, lots of boiler plants which just run 100% uh, on bark. In addition to the forms and shapes we saw, the following characteristics demonstrate the requirements of tailoring a plant to ensure it remains economic. Uh, as you could see before, shredded and hog material can also contain a high amount of fines, which needs to be addressed when designing an energy plant. Especially with fresh reduce from landscaping, green matter will come with the biomass, which also re requires consideration when designing the boiler plant. The earth which comes with the biomass has no value, but it needs to be considered and maximum amounts should be agreed between fuel supplier, operator and boiler supplier. Due to the lower energy density uh, of biomass when compared to fossil fuels, larger storage areas are required and the angle of repose needs to be understood to uh, avoid issues later. And lastly, but probably most importantly, uh, to consider when tailoring an energy plant is fuel flexibility. In general, the higher the fuel flexibility of an energy plant, the more future-proof and economic a boiler plant will be. Now to six Australasian installations in the horticulture industry, so those are basically hot water boiler plants, uh, where owners have been benefiting from installing a polytechnic boiler plant due to its high fuel flexibility. 
The first reference plant, uh, which is uh, uh, which replaced two old coal boilers, demonstrates that uh, even small boiler plants can handle a wide range of uh, residues. This plant has won several awards in New Zealand, hailed for setting new industry standards. Um, so it basically just runs on all sorts of forest and uh, landscaping residues and provides hot water for the glass houses. Another showcase plant is near Auckland, um, is heating large glass houses. Our customer's main goal here was uh, to be carbon neutral, uh, as cheap gas would have been available on site too. To increase the utilization of the boiler plant, uh, which is an issue obviously when running on, on wet fuel or, or a contaminated, more contaminated with dirt contaminated fuel, uh, is uh, a, a heat storage tank. So those typically installations in, 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 in glass house applications would often include a large heat storage tank, uh, which is used uh, to give the boiler better utilization and to run it more continuously. The next reference plants are in Victoria, where we've replaced old fossil fueled boilers against state of the art uh, boil, uh, biomass boilers. Uh, this installation also uh, demonstrates the importance of fuel flexibility, as the fuel suppliers have changed several times in the last five years. So, what the you know, every time I go to site, I can see the customer has got a different fuel, a different cost, and the different availabilities. Not far from the previous installation, a slightly bigger plant is uh, using similar residues as with, uh, uh, with other hot water boiler plants in this application, the heat storage tank is common practice to ensure a good utilization as I mentioned before. This plant near Melbourne replaced two large gas boilers due to the installation in this case of a very large heat storage tank, which has got 2 million liters. Um, the boiler plant can be could be optimized smaller than it would have to be otherwise and has got a, a very high utilization. So it was not too difficult to be more economic uh, than the existing gas fired boilers. The last showcase is an installation in Christchurch where two boilers replaced an old wood boiler, uh, which couldn't meet the emission limits. The installation of those two boilers not only ensured uh, lowest possible emissions, it also reduced the operating cost significantly as polytechnic boiler plants are usually designed for unattended operation. That's me, thank you. And I will hand uh, over to uh, Tony Espin. Thanks, Christian. I, just, um, I hope you've got access now. Yep, I'll just... Uh, Share a screen. Um, screen two. Can you uh, see that now? Just coming on now, Tony. Is it, is it up there, Gav? Yep, it's there now. Okay. Um, thanks, guys. Uh, my name's Tony Esplin, and I'm with Recycling Technologies Group. And we design, build, and install um, biomass wood pellet and briquetting line equipment, um, including you know, dryers, hammer mills, the pelleting lines, and the uh, and the and the packaging of those as well. We work with uh, a number of European uh, vendors to uh, make that happen and deliver uh, turnkey um, turnkey plant track clients. So <clears throat> today, I've been asked to talk a little bit about uh, some of the export opportunities for Tasmanian producers of uh, wood pellets and uh, you know, primarily wood pellets. So we can pretty much split the market into, into two export opportunities for Tasmanian producers. Um, the overseas markets, the big ones are obviously Japan and Korea, and I'll, I'll talk more about those shortly. Um, and then of course, uh, the Australian market, the mainland. Um, we just need to understand the some of the, the broad brush characteristics of the differences of these markets before we get going, um, because they vary greatly. Uh, obviously, the overseas markets are going to be large scale. Typically, plants are going to uh, be in the vicinity of 150, 180,000 tonnes and larger. Um, domestic plants are going to be small scale, typically, you know, 
between one to three thousand tons per annum. With the large plants, um, each I think the smaller ship that uh, makes it economical is going to be something around thirty thousand tons. So if you're producing one hundred eighty thousand tons of pellets, you've got to have a thirty thousand ton ship load ready every two months. Um, so a number of considerations have to be made. Uh, where are these pellets going to be stored? Are they going to be stored at the port? How are they going to be kept waterproof? So there's some key logistics answers that need to be addressed during the initial planning stages as they will definitely affect the, uh, the actual production and design of the storage facility. The Australian market, uh, much smaller. You can uh, sell bulk bags, 15, 20 kilo bags, um, or, or one ton bulk of bags. And typically they'll go direct to market. So back to the overseas markets, um, there is an opportunity, some terrific opportunities to export pellets, which I'll show you in some uh, future slides. But um, one option that hasn't yet been considered in Australia is for smaller pellet mills to uh, form a cooperative for distribution um, and sales to those um, overseas markets. I think that's an area that um, is going to um, show some, uh, some promise going forward. If we look at the Australian pellet demand, um, basically all of Tasmania, um, there's a lot of uh, good pellet demand down there for, for uh, pellet heaters in use in domestic homes. Um, as the uh, adoption of uh, boilers, small boilers takes place, uh, that's gonna accelerate demand as well. And of course, uh, on the east coast of Australia and a little bit on the west coast. But um, that's primarily the, all the cold areas outside of that. Um, there's not much demand for pellet. And we're anticipating um, that demand is growing in Australia on the mainland by about 2,000 tonnes uh, every year domestically at the moment. And that will continue to grow. As I said, once the, the uptake of um, pellet power boilers um, reaches a, a high level, um, the demand for pellets will continue to increase. <clears throat> Traditional fibre sources are becoming scarce. Well, they sure are. Um, we've got lots of competing interest for the fibre. We've seen uh, the, the biofuels, uh, we've seen the biomass. Um, so markets are now starting to turn to developing alternative fibre sources, um, such as sugarcane trash, rice paddy straw, um, cotton stalks, and so on. The uh, Korean buyers are turning to these products because uh, they're cheaper and they're getting a lot of their supply from the Southeast Asian countries, Vietnam, Thailand in particular, are um, putting in some uh, new pellet plants and they're using these agricultural products. Um, one of the issues with the agri-cropping pellets is that they've got a higher ash content. So that tends to um, <coughs> uh, cause issues um, in the uh, in the boilers, sorry, in the in the burners when they're co-firing them with the coal. Um, okay, I'll just get on to the next slide. These these next two slides, uh, I couldn't fit it all on one page, so uh, I just wanted to show you in um, primarily in Japan and Korea the new biomass projects that are greater than 75 megawatts electrical. Um, you can see here what the pellet demand is for each one of them. And the new pellet demand <coughs> is estimated to be um, in excess of 7 million tonnes um, just to feed these. I'll go back to the, that's the first slide. That's the second slide. Just to feed the, um, these new projects coming on stream. Okay, so how do we make these projects happen? There are five key pillars to making the, making the, um, the projects work. The first one is the hardest to achieve. It's the fibre supply. And it's also the most important and a couple of the other uh, presenters have uh, touched on this point as well. The long-term fibre supply agreements are required. Typically 15 to 20 years is required to match the lifespan of the project's equipment. Uh, and historically, Australian fibre suppliers and the forestry departments um, don't like to give um, fibre supplies that long. 
Um, but the Asian customers, they're used to the long-term fibre agreements, uh, long-term supply agreements, I should say. And this is the single biggest hurdle to outcome. The second point, the technical solution, <clears throat> I think that's the easiest one of the lot. Um, but the solution still has to be pressure tested to ensure that uh, local characteristics are taken into account. Financing, um, if the project stacks up with the other four pillars um, on this slide, then financing shouldn't be an issue. Uh, the world is awash with capital at the moment and good projects will get financed if they have been critically analysed and uh, passed the required internal rate of return hurdle rate. Logistics, that's the second most difficult pillar to solve. Having port access is absolute gold. In Australia, we live on an island, and if we want to play on the world stage, then we must have infrastructure in place to be able to efficiently move our products to these overseas markets in bulk volumes. Um, the government has a duty of care here to ensure that the producers who are prepared to commit the funds towards these production infrastructures are allowed to access the ports at a reasonable cost and on a regular basis to enable them to get their products to market. Obviously, the location of any pellet manufacturing project needs to have uh, efficient access to the port proximity. Um, this might be by road or rail, uh, and bulk storage at the port will be required. Of course, when the ship arrives to collect the pellets, it needs to be loaded at the rate in excess of 1,000 tonnes per hour um, to minimise the time the ship's in port. So everything has to be ready when that ship comes in. Finally, the offtake agreement. Obviously, um, this is required to secure financing and right now um, they are available because of the demand for pellets outstrip supply. Um, as long as new renewable energy plants continue to be built, and I think they will be, you saw that on the previous slide, the demand for wood pellets will continue at a steady upward trajectory. Um, in Australia, we're blessed with an abundant supply of biomass with which to manufacture pellets. That might be agri waste pellets or forestry waste. The technology is out there to convert this material to pellets and the markets um, are taking them right at this minute. Governments have also got to get on board and recognise that these industries are value create, creating industries um, and uh, they employ regional workers. Most of these projects are located in regional areas, which is good. Um, and uh, it creates jobs up and down the supply chain. Finally, the policy levers uh, need to be pulled and pushed to facilitate the infrastructure investment uh, within the industry, both on a domestic uh, scale and an international scale. Uh, that's a good thing about pellets. They can be made to be uh, making money on small scale and large scale. And once we're all pulling in the same direction, I think the Australian wood pellet and briquetting sector uh, has a pretty bright future. So um, that's it for me. Thanks uh, for your time. And uh, now I'm going to hand over to Annette. Uh, let's see. I'm going to do that. Um. Great. Annette? Yep, looks like it's going to work now. How are we doing? Uh, it's good. Are we in presentation mode yet? No, no, you need to. There it is. There we go. Good. Um, great. Well, thanks for the opportunity to talk to you briefly. I'll try and keep it as brief as possible because it looks like we're running a bit over time. Um, I'm Annette Cowie. I'm from the New South Wales Department of Primary Industries located in Armidale and I'm part of the climate branch. I'm going to talk uh, very briefly about a few of the environmental and socioeconomic co-benefits from bioenergy. If my slide will progress, great. Um, so the major reason we're interested in bioenergy is because it has potential to uh, contribute to climate change mitigation. It is essentially a carbon neutral energy source as long as the biomass is recently grown and it is regrown after it's harvested, apart from uh, the fossil fuels used in the supply chain. That's why I say mostly. 
the essential difference between bioenergy and fossil fuel, um, noting that both of them put CO2 into the atmosphere at the point of combustion, is that bioenergy is part of the short carbon cycle. So as I say, as long as the plants are regrown, um, you have a circular carbon flow, whereas fossil fuel is one way traffic from below ground where it was safely stored up into the atmosphere where it has permanent warming impact. Now, this is an example of a study that we did in New South Wales, looking at one of our major um, regions of managed forestry, managed native forests. So these are forests that are currently managed for timber production. And we looked at um, the, uh, over time, the climate change mitigation impact of using those forests for as they are currently for timber and using the residues for bioenergy, we looked at the displacement of fossil fuels and the displacement of greenhouse gas intensive building products um, that occurs through using timber instead of concrete steel and aluminium. And we compared that with the carbon stock of if, if we just stopped harvesting. And what we found was that um, initially, of course, if you don't harvest, um, you have a higher carbon stock in the conservation forest. But over time, what you find is from the managed forest, you have an increasing mitigation benefit from those products that are in use uh, that eventually end up in landfill, uh, the bioenergy that's displacing fossil fuels and um, the displaced greenhouse gases from other building products. And so over time, we found that a managed forest does in fact have a greater climate change mitigation value than a conservation forest. Now, of course, um, Tasmania is <laughs> on the verge of 100% renewable, but the rest of Australia certainly isn't. And so transformation of Australia's energy sector towards 100% renewables is critical to meeting the global uh, climate target. And wind and solar are what most people think of when they think of renewable, but as we here today are all thoroughly aware, uh, bioenergy can certainly be part of the solution. Um, uh, furthermore, uh, bioenergy can support rural employment. Uh, for example, a medium-sized pellet mill with production capacity of, of 100,000 tonnes per annum employs about 20 people full-time, and that excludes the jobs in construction and those in um, harvesting and downstream processing and transport and logistics. One of the real benefits of bioenergy is that it can fill the gap. This is a study that was done by Ming Yu Li at Sydney Uni, and what she was looking at was prospects for 100% renewable electricity in Australia and how um, CSP and bioenergy could work together. And so in the green there, um, that's the bioenergy coming in on a daily basis through winter um, to fill the gaps when, there, when there's low wind and low solar. And what they found was that this was able to substantially reduce the levelized cost of electricity because it reduced the amount of installed capacity um, that you needed as long as you had that biomass ready to, to plug the gaps. Now, one of the technologies I'd like to mention in particular, I don't think we've heard a lot about this today, is pyrolysis. Um, I should have said pyrolysis and gasification here. Um, what I'm talking about, I'm sure most of you are familiar, is heating biomass in a low oxygen environment, uh, which produces a combustible syngas for an, an renewable energy source and also produces the co-product of biochar, which can be used as a soil amendment. And uh, pyrolysis gasification can be done at many different scales, looking here from cook stove through to large scale engineered plants processing several tonnes an hour. Um, the biochar co-product is a very stable form of carbon. It's estimated to last hundreds to thousands of years in the soil. Um, it also has the benefits that uh, it can improve soil properties, for example, increasing water holding and nutrient holding capacity and reducing the emissions of the powerful greenhouse gas nitrous oxide. Um, the advantage of pyrolysis and gasification is that it's much more flexible when it comes to feedstocks. It can use those things like, um, like chicken litter and crop residues that others have mentioned can be problematic um, in relation to ash and also high moisture contents. And one of the projects that um, Matt from Arena mentioned is the Logan uh, wastewater treatment plant that's up in the top right corner. And that's a new project that's um, Logan City wastewater treatment plant processes uh, 34,000 tonnes of biosolids per year. And they spend 1.8 million in disposal costs for those biosolids. And so this new plant is going to gasify the biosolids because it's going to produce the electricity to power the plant. Um, and it's also going to produce um, 
produce biochar and uh, the heat will destroy pathogens and also uh, destroy microplastics, which are increasingly being uh, seen as a problem in sewage sludge. And so that's going to produce a product that's much more um, user friendly in terms of transporting and applying than deep-watered sludge. And it's going to save Logan City about half a million dollars a year. The next technology I'd like to mention is anaerobic digestion. This is the example of a project in New South Wales. It's a piggery, 2,000 sow piggery, I think, land tire farms. And um, they've covered their effluent pond and they're making biogas and they're uh, making electricity feeding into the grid. Um, and what they're doing is they're also offering a service in waste management, you know, taking a lot of the food uh, processing residues, milk residues and unsold food, bread and vegetables and feeding that to their pigs. Um, and so I guess they're upcycling uh, the food waste into, into pork power and fertiliser because the anaerobic digestate from the um, AD uh, is a very useful fertiliser. Uh, and similar systems like this could be applied uh, to dairy effluent and also for abattoir waste. And the final example uh, that I'd like to mention is how you can use energy crops usefully in the agricultural landscape to bring heterogeneity, which is important for, uh, for biodiversity. Uh, and also you can use perennial grasses to, um, to control soil erosion, to stop runoff into waterways. And you can plant uh, short rotation woody tree crops in ways that can provide shelter to stock, for example. Um, there are several eucalypt species that coppice readily, so they can be uh, quite suitable for that. So just in summary, uh, I'd like to mention, as you already know, um, bioenergy is here. It's now, um, it's very versatile. A range of different products can be produced and it can be readily integrated with our existing infrastructure. It can support the expansion of the intermittent renewables. And what's more, it can be beneficial uh, as long as we apl apply it strategically. Uh, it can deliver environmental and agricultural benefits through energy crops and through using biochar as a soil amendment. It can offer services in waste management and it can enhance rural employment. Thanks. And I would like to pass on to Thomas. Thanks very much, Annette. You able to share yet, Thomas? It is absolutely just chosen right now to crash on me. Hold on one second. Is it working, Thomas? Hey, Gav, maybe we could have a few questions while we're waiting yeah, for I you think, to get back on. I think so. Just to, um, so in the group chat, we've got a few questions. Uh, Thomas. Yeah. Hi everyone. That was perfect timing. I can't wait till this virus is over. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, shall I go ahead or did you want to, uh, no, if you, if you could bring your presentation up, uh, that'd be good. Yeah. There we go. Okay. Uh, thanks everyone for hanging in there. Uh, and especially thanks to Elena for warming up the crowd for us. Um, 
So I'm with a company called Justin Pacific. We do biomass boiler projects all over Australia, really. We've got systems in three states so far, and it's going to be five. Um, and I was asked by Bioenergy in Australia to do like a decision tree for what would make uh, for, a, for a good biomass boiler project. And um, I do these uh, a lot uh, on, uh, you know, different conferences around. And normally the decision tree goes to something like seven pages. But here's what it is for biomass energy in Tasmania. Do you have a facility that is running a boiler? And if you do, then you should definitely consider bioenergy. Um, the combination of the, uh, the cost of energy, uh, the energy infrastructure in Tasmania, and the superabundance of biomass uh, really makes this something that anyone that needs to generate any kind of thermal energy should at least look at. Um, and you know, for us, we we really love Tasmania. Tasmania has a lot going for it in terms of what we can actually bring with our clients. Um, so who can actually use the, the biomass boilers? We are doing a lot of work really primarily with, with folks in the agricultural sector, basically food makers. And not only does Australia make a lot of food and process a lot of food, but obviously that's, that's one of the sort of beating hearts of, of the Tasmanian economy. So any, uh, anyone that needs steam or hot water for, for any kind of food processing is instantly going to be in a position where this is going to be something worth looking at. Um, hospitals and care facilities, these are quite overlooked, I think, in Australia with regard to, uh, to what biomass can actually bring. These are places that require um, typically quite a lot of, of hot water, and especially, again, in, Tas in, uh, well, in Tasmania and in, and in Australia generally, they are often located in areas where energy costs are very high, um, and they're really, really good use cases just on a technical level for, for, for what biomass boilers can deliver. Schools, um, you know, as I'm sure Christian is, is very aware, New Zealand uh, is very proactively looking at how they can reduce the uh, carbon emissions of their, their schooling system. And uh, in a place like Tasmania, where the heating system, the, where the heating season goes for, for such a large part of the year, um, I think there's a real opportunity there. And um, Justin's uh, bread and butter, uh, our heritage really in Denmark is putting in district heating systems uh, where a single boiler will heat, you know, many hundreds or many thousands of homes. And in terms of a low carbon, very cost effective way for heating homes, then this would be something that we would obviously encourage uh, anyone in government who, who looks after infrastructure in, in Hobart and also Launceston, the larger, the larger cities and towns, to take a look at. Uh, so when would you not use a, a biomass boiler? One of, the, one of the facts of life with biomass is that it's always going to take up more space than a gas boiler. Um, the, I mean, the boiler itself will take up somewhat more space, but the emissions controls and, and of course fuel storage are things which are uh, part and parcel of, of any biomass. So if you have your site that's completely built out to the perimeter and you don't have enough uh, space to swing a cat, then that's going to, that's always going to make it difficult for, for putting in a biomass system. Um, fortunately in Australia, we are blessed with uh, a little bit of space. Space constraints aren't as, as severe as in other parts of the world. And to be honest, we haven't really found this to be much of a problem so far in, in the companies that, and the facilities and sites that we work on. Um, higher temperatures, we're never really going to be working with the steel uh, manufacturing or concrete manufacturing facilities and, and mineral processing. Um, where biomass can bring, uh, you know, really the best of it is for temperatures that are, I guess, more on the moderate side. And, you know, it, it, an easy way to uh, determine if you're on the moderate side is, are you processing anything organic? Because obviously you're not going to apply 2000 degrees to beef uh, or to, uh, to milk. So, if you need in the sort of, you know, 100, 200, 300 degrees uh, in terms of your process heat, 
that's something that can easily be attained by biomass. Um, and location constraints. I mean, this this flows into the space constraints element. I mean, I, I spent a lot of time in Hobart. Um, obviously, we're not going to be putting any biomass boilers in the middle of Hobart. Uh, I mean, the sites are, are one thing, but also just simply getting you know large quantities of biomass into the middle of Hobart uh, is, is is just going to be a nightmare. Um, so we we typically work with folks that are located regionally or on the fringes of city. Uh, fringes of cities, just so that we can get that good access to, to biomass. Um, in terms of what we can use as a fuel, uh, any kind of timber fraction uh, is is going to uh, be really good for us. And obviously, that's something that, that Tasmania has a super abundance of. Um, in Australia right now, we're doing projects uh, primarily using green material. So that's you know, moisture content of at or above 55% moisture uh, for a variety of reasons. I can go into that uh, later if you'd like. But wood chips, sawdust, bark, um, I mean, really any part of a tree is, is going, to be, going to be good for us. Um, in Denmark and, and actually in, in Europe uh, more, and also the UK, we're using a lot of straw. Um, again, there are a number of reasons for this, but straws, uh, straws are great fuel for us. We, um, we, yeah, we really like using it and this is something that Tasmania is, uh, is, is going to be generating uh, quite a bit of. Uh, we're doing a project with, with nut waste as, as well. I mean, basically if it's relatively dry uh, and it's an organic material, we can probably use it uh, as a fuel. Um, and what we as a company uh, will, will always look to do, I mean, just as, as a matter of course, um, is we always want to use sustainable uh, resources and, and we will demonstrate to our clients uh, and really to, to, to any sort of concerned uh, citizens that we're in the sustainability business. Uh, do we need to be generating our own waste as fuel? No, absolutely not. Um, we've done one project with a sawmill in, in New South Wales and obviously they were generating their, their own fuel, fantastic fuel, but none of the other projects we've done in Australia uh, are making their own fuel. The, these, are, uh, these are arrangements that, that we can actually help our clients with in terms of teeing up that, that long-term fuel supply. Um, just a, a couple of uh, photos here to show you sort of what we actually do you know, in the flesh. This is a 15 megawatt system uh, in the sawmill I mentioned in, in southern New South Wales at the moment. Um, we know exactly what the emissions requirements are all over Australia, Tasmania included, uh, and we will always guarantee our emissions will uh, stay under anything that, that the state uh, is, is asking us to attain. Um, this is a, a, a canola processing facility in, in New South Wales, a five megawatt system. Um, this is a, an abattoir in uh, Victoria, just a, a smaller system, three and a half, and you can see they're using just green sawdust there for their fuel uh, on the left-hand side. Uh, and this is green. It's it's kind of hard to get you know very um, attractive photos of biomass boilers because they tend to be inside um, you know <laughs> sheds. So uh, trust us, this is that green. Um, so I really like to keep my presentation short and as sweet as possible, um, but I love talking about this stuff. So if anyone has any questions or really would just like to talk about anything to do with biomass, um, drop me a line. I'd be very, very happy to, to talk to you. Thanks for your time. Thanks, Thomas. That's uh, that's great. And uh, thanks to all our speakers too. I think it's a great selection of, uh, of projects and technologies that are already in place and opportunities uh, uh, for what uh, is a very flexible as we know, uh, uh, a product and uh, heat source, and electricity source, all those kind of things. I think we've got uh, we got some time uh, for some some questions. I'll go to the the group chat to begin with, and this one starting with um, uh, for Gary for McCain. Uh, have you done a cost benefit uh, analysis of drying or torrifying wood waste first? So this harks back to it's a common theme I think through through most um, uh, of these presentations about different fuel sources having different moisture contents, making it a bit difficult to uh, uh, to have predictable um, uh, uh, furnish into these processes. But uh, Gary, have you, are you able to comment on that? 
Yep, so we, we had a look at it um, as part of the, the, the 37 million upgrade we've just done. Um, we're very, very restricted for space. Um, we've looked at different, different methods of, of drawing the fuel. Um, we pretty much uh, use our, our waste energy um, heat um, through the plant at the moment. So yeah, we did look at it, but um, as I say, yeah, the space and the, uh, and the energy available that's required to use it, we, ju we just didn't have it. Uh, thanks for that. Uh, thanks for that, Gary. Um, uh, I'll hand it to Christian uh, uh, and maybe Thomas after after you, Christian. Have you got thoughts on that as well? So can you ask the question again, please? Okay. So the question is um, uh, about the cost benefit of drying or torrifying wood waste first. So trying to get it to a to a sort of more consistent moisture content before utilizing it? Yeah, I'm, I'm probably the wrong one to answer that because most of our boiler plants are actually all of our boiler plants are basically designed to use uh, uh, the biomass residues as they come. So yep. specialized in using the material as, as it is. So uh, drying the material um, obviously uh, would make the boiler plant more, more simple and cheaper. Um, but comes as a cost with the fuel. And what we found with, with most of our customers is that the cost of fuel are the most important thing, not the cost of the uh, investment. So if, if you do the numbers on a good utilization of an energy plant, you would find that fuel cost is basically everything. And, and that's why we're focusing on using the residues as they come. Uh, thanks, Christian. Thomas, do you have any thoughts on that one? Uh, yeah. Christian's exactly right. Uh, we want to get the biomass to the client at the most economical point possible. And, and the more you handle it, the more you touch it, uh, the more you do to it, it just adds cost at every stage. So um, that's, that's one of the virtues of, of our systems is we're really flexible in the fuels that we can use. And we always want to use basically the, the cheapest, you know, um, you know, we're not making paper out of it, we're just burning. We, we always want cheap fuels. Okay, thanks, Thomas. Uh, next question is probably for Trevor. There's 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 a three there, Trevor, in terms of uh, your CLT and glue lamp plant. Uh, uh, where's the current thinking on where that might be uh, sited? Uh, it's either going to be um, in Victoria or South Australia. That's yet to be um, finalised. Should be finalised in the next few weeks. Yeah. Okay. And the other one was around uh, uh, your indexes. Uh, the SBTs determine a company's share of the 1.5 degree target internationally. That's from Annette, I think. Yeah, yeah I was wondering how um, SBTI determines when individual companies' contribution to the global target. Um, they've basically got a very complicated manual <laughs> <laughs> um, and a set of guidelines for each industry that you need to work through. So they've kind of started from the top down and figured out globally what sectors should contribute what proportion um, to the carbon reduction and then yeah, break that down within each sector. Hmm, interesting, thank you. Presumably that's info is available online. Yeah, if you go to, if you do Google for SBTI, mm -hmm. you can find all the info in there. Thank you. Thanks, Trevor. Uh, just another one there is uh, uh, how are the particulates trapped by the baghouse filter disposed of in your case? Um, so the the ash that we um, capture, we send to a farm for soil remediation. So it's disposed of, um, yeah, on soil. It's just, you know, carbon remediation for soil. Yep. Thank you. Um, checking out, running through. I had one around um, uh, how we build uh, collaborative relationships between different feedstock sources to build scale. I'm not sure who's the best to talk about that, but uh, I think it's becoming pretty obvious. And Thomas, you made the comment that uh, you want it as uh, you know, your residues and uh, you want certainty of that, uh, that furnish as well. How do you, uh, 
uh, what's the best method, maybe an international sort of uh, ways of doing that, uh, bringing together a bunch of different uh, agricultural timber residues, those kind of things to, to get scale? Well, whatever goes into a biomass boiler has to be reasonably consistent. Um, and so, for example, straw is typically much, much drier than really any kind of biomass. And so that's going to then have knock-on effects onto how the, how the combustion works. Um, <clears throat> look, I mean, fuel is, fuel is the beating heart of any biomass boiler project. But again, like we haven't really struggled to find fuel in Australia and maybe that will be different, you know, in, in 10 years time or, or, or who knows when. But uh, again, because we want just really low value, low, low grade things. And, um, you know, because these, uh, that the actual generators of this material uh, tend to be pretty motivated in getting it off off their site. Um, we we haven't, yeah, really found this to be to be much of an of an issue. I mean, we're doing we're doing some quite large projects in Australia at the moment, and yeah, fuel supply has has not been a problem for us. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Thomas. Um, just trying to look through the questions here. I think we're, we're coming to, has anyone else got any questions around that? Uh, just put your hand up. I think we can do that on, on here. Is there any questions that uh, are burning? I'd like to ask Tony about the torrified uh, pellets, black pellets, because one of the issues, of course, is that if pellets are out in the rain, they uh, don't last too well. But torrified pellets are better than that regard. Yeah, um, there's uh, a range of torrified uh, um, technology around the world, um, but just to, write, to zoom right in on your point there, Annette, um, the benefit with black pellets is that uh, you simply change um, the composition from being um, hydroscopic to hydrophobic. In other words, they repel water. Uh, the benefit of that, of course, is that uh, it enables you to store pellets uh, potentially outside or at uh, very minimum under um, a, a semi-waterproof um, you know, bulk storage facility. Um, but they won't absorb moisture and then crumble uh, apart. Um, the other benefit with them, of course, is that um, the moisture content within the pellet will drop to somewhere around four to five percent, um, thereby raising the calorific value of that pellet as well uh, and increasing the uh, commercial um, value of that pellet to the um, to the end user in Japan. In other words, you know, more, more, more bang for your buck. So is it cost effective to do it? Uh, it will be cost effective to do it, yes. Um, but there's a range of technologies out there that have been trialled. Um, some of them work, some of them don't. Um, it's one of these watch this space, um, one of these uh, watch this space type of technologies because it's being uh, constantly developed. But um, once you when you start producing black pellets, you, you're driving off the VOCs, the volatile organic compounds. You're producing um, you know, tars and uh, you know uh, other gases that need to be recondensed. Um, and that can be quite corrosive on, equip on the equipment. Um, but I, I would say within a couple of years, um, it will be cost effective to do it. It's one of those um, uh, continual developing technologies. Thanks, Tony. And thanks, Annette, for the question. Uh, there's another one here, and I'll broadly throw it out there and, uh, and, and see uh, maybe uh, Thomas or, or someone else can sort of give you indications, but what are the costs per tonne for feedstock that you work with? Obviously, we've been talking about a whole bunch of different uh, feedstocks, some close, some further away, some drier, uh, from different agricultural or, or uh, timber residues. What's, is there a rule of thumb, Thomas? Uh, no, it's, it's really case by case. Um, transport is always a, a, a big um, factor, so you can have very cheap, biomass but you know you're hauling it a long way it's it's really a case-by-case -case basis um uh, you know again having said that you know we 
we have um, some great folks that supply us with fuel um, and we haven't uh, found that it causes too much of a problem financially. Uh, it's, it's, not, it's not that high a cost. Thanks, Thomas. Does anyone else want to weigh in on that one? Paul, I think you had your hand up. Did that answer that question? Obviously, it's a critical question. Thank you to all the speakers. But clearly, uh, we're looking at a range of technologies, whether we torrify the chip and dry it and make it uh, hydrophobic, whether we take it as a raw material from a, a distance away. I work on logistics chains within forestry and within a range of export-based industries in Tasmania. And for me to get colleagues motivated and enthusiastic, obviously we've heard today about the need for securing your feedstock and understanding very much the calorific content or heat content you're gonna get out of any particular type of material. And you need to diversify the type of boiler you use so that it has a degree of flexibility. So that, that ton, ratio is a really important one for people to even make that first initial step to look at whether or not they're going to go down the bioenergy route. It would be great to get a range from the speakers. We've got a number of very exciting projects with McCain's and with Greenham's. It'd be great to understand if they're happy and willing to share with us what kind of range they're doing per tonne for their feed stocks. I appreciate it varies from material to material, but clearly I do a lot of work on moisture management and ambient drying. Um, so I'd be very grateful if the speakers were willing to share a little bit more. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Uh, does anyone want to um, offer up anything more on that or uh, I can go back to the, uh, the questions on the group chat? Yeah, just Gary here. So yeah, I'm more than willing to, you know, to, to share info and have a discussion around it. Um, look, I think I think the, the most important thing, like I appreciate what the, the two boiler manufacturer guys are, guys are saying, um, but for industries such as ours, you know, like you, you've got to really have consistency in pressure. Um, pressure and temperature obviously directly related. Any drop in pressure will then, um, like say for us, it's, yeah, we, we basically got to shut down um, our processing facility. Um, so I think, you know, like, for us, um, we we got the capability to burn different types of fuel, and, um, and which we do. Um, but for us, it's it's all about consistency of that fuel moisture, so you can get your boiler set up and and be reliable. Thanks, Gary. Just th there's a question uh, from Valentina here. Um, working on a project to produce renewable diesel from forest residues. I wonder if anyone knows a database where I can find information about forest residue flows in Tasmania, only uh, forest and plantation. We have heard earlier from Martin Moroni around ABBA, and that's around the, the nation, but certainly uh, Tassie uh, has information in that there. So um, uh, Valentina will, will get you We'll get you that link, but uh, can anyone else offer up anything? Well, I think I think that's about that's about it. Uh, I'll get you that uh, ABBA link anyway, uh, Valentina. All right, I think we've done. Most of the questions there. They're calling us to go back to the uh, back to the main room. So I uh, just wanted to round out in uh, heaps of great presentations, uh, great involvement as well. Thank you, thank you all, and uh, hopefully you uh, you got um, uh, something out of today. And it's uh, really useful for me to see um, you know, a lot of people talk about the the flexibility of bioenergy and bioenergy projects, but really great to see a bunch of ones that are already in place in Tasmania, around Australia and New Zealand as well. So, so I think that's uh, thanks to all that spoke and thanks to all that attended. And I think we'll go back to the other, the other room now.